This is the first year algebra-based physics course. Topic 4 is about forces, otherwise known as dynamics. In this section, 4.5a, we'll be talking about the big G equation using the universal law of gravitation. What we'll cover in section A will be the first three bullets here. The universal law of gravitation, we'll talk about the symbols and the units and what the universal law of gravitation means. Uh, number two, the universal gravitational constant, that's the big capital G that appears in the universal law of gravitation. And we'll be calculating the gravitational force between two objects, two protons or two planets, whatever. Now, in section B, we'll be covering the other four topics. So this, really, you want to watch um, video 4.5a, uh, maybe finish the problems, and then follow up with video 4.5b and those problems to get a thorough understanding of the universal law of gravitation. So what will we be learning in this lesson? Well, first of all, a lot of things, <laughs> but let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, number one, the universal law of gravitation. This equation, Fg equals G M1 M2 over R squared. We'll be talking about what all of those symbols mean in a few minutes. Now, this law was discovered by Isaac Newton in 1686, 1687. Of course, other physicists were involved, but Isaac Newton was the man who put it all together and published. Uh, he was an English physicist. Um, what he published was a scientific work, a really enormous scientific work, uh, which, which was called the Principia. Now, 111 years after the Principia was published, and 71 years after Newton's death, a physicist named Henry Cavendish, also an Englishman, uh, measured G, this G, the universal gravitational constant. He measured it in his laboratory. This man was very, very uh, humble, very shy, but very, very, very precise in the laboratory. So he was able to figure out that G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And again, we'll be talking about uh, both of these in much more detail as we move through the lesson. Let's see what else we'll be learning in this lesson. So one of the things that we can do with the universal law of gravitation is calculate the mutual gravitational force between any two objects or samples of matter. So for example, we can calculate, we, we know that two protons are going to attract each other gravitationally. Right, we can draw this proton attracting this one and we can draw this proton attracting this one. All right. So now uh, we can calculate uh, the magnitude all right, of those gravitational forces using the universal law of gravitation. We know that the Sun attracts the Earth and the Earth attracts the Sun. So the Earth attracts the Sun all right, and the Sun attracts the Earth. All right, and those two should be exactly the same magnitude. So we can calculate the magnitude of those mutual gravitational forces. We're also going to calculate the equation to determine the acceleration due to gravity of any celestial object. You probably have already seen this simple equation for figuring out the weight of an object given its mass and knowing on Earth that G is 9.81 meters per second squared or rounded off to 10. Well, we're introducing this equation today, all right, this lesson. Now, I'm just going to switch the G and the M, and I don't think you'll mind, because you know that it does, doesn't really change anything. All right, so now we've got FG equals G times M, and by doing that, it makes it a little bit easier to see that GM over R squared is actually going to be equal to G, the acceleration due to gravity. You've got, you've got FG here, you've got an M over here, 
and therefore little g must be equal to big G m1 over r squared. That's assuming that this m and this m are the same, which we will do problems where they are. All right, so we will derive the equation that little g, the acceleration due to gravity for any celestial body, is going to be equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of that body divided by the distance, uh, I'm sorry, the radius of that body from the center of the body to the edge. All right, so over r squared. This would be the radius of that celestial body, the mass of the celestial body and its radius. All right, so I'll show you how to get that equation from these two equations. Finally, we will revisit from the last lesson uh, calculating the weight of any object on or near the surface of any celestial body. All right, so on Earth, this guy is on Earth. Let's call him, um, let's call him Pio. All right, so Pio is on Earth, and he has a certain weight. All right, on the moon, we know he would weigh less. We're going to do those calculations. And on Jupiter, we know he would weigh more. All right, so you see the, the vector arrow for the weight, all right, is the largest for Jupiter. It's medium in length magnitude for the Earth. All right, and smallest for the moon. Again, Jupiter is a gas giant. You can't really stand on the surface of Jupiter, but let's make believe. <laughs> um, the last thing we'll do is just a few quick kinematics problems on celestial bodies other than the Earth. So in other words, if I were to take, uh, if this guy here, if Pio were to take a coin and drop it from a certain height, let's say from a height of two meters, I guess he's pretty tall, so he's going to drop it from a height of two meters. On Earth, it's going to take a certain amount of time to hit the ground because the moon has a smaller acceleration due to gravity. Um, the moon, it's going to take longer for that coin to hit the ground from the same height of two meters. And on Jupiter, because of its much, large, uh, much larger acceleration due to gravity, that coin is going to hit the ground true much, much more quickly on Jupiter. Again, gas giant, you can't really stand on Jupiter and drop a coin and expect to catch it. Well, I guess you could if you were all floating together, but um, <laughs> it's going to take, it's going to hit, it's, the coin is going to drop two meters much more quickly near the surface of Jupiter because Jupiter is much, much stronger and it's pulling it down at a much, much faster rate. All right, so these are the things we'll be doing in this video in much more detail. So let's start by looking at the law of universal gravitation, this one, otherwise known affectionately as the big G equation. You see the big G there. Now, the name for big G is the universal gravitational constant. Let's look at it quickly on the reference tables. Okay, so you got to look at the universal gravitational constant on the reference tables, and you know that G, the universal gravitational constant, is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Now, let's take a look at this unit. Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. All right, now let me show you where that unit comes from. If we start with the law of universal gravitation, right, Fg equals big G m1 m2 over r squared. And we rearrange this equation to get the big G by itself. So let's start by cross multiplying. All right, so Fg r squared equals big G m1 m2. Then divide both sides by m1 times m2. All right, what you find is that we get the equation. All that cancels. We get the equation that G is equal to fgr squared 
over m1 times m2. So I'm going to take that equation and move it over here and figure out what the unit for this, the unit gravitation, universal gravitational constant, would be by filling in all of the units on this side. So g equals fg r squared over m1 times m2. All right, so the unit for big G, therefore, would be the unit for force, which is Newton, times the unit for radius, which is meter squared, right, over kilogram times kilogram would be kilogram squared. All right, so now you see where the unit for G comes from. G equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. That's why the unit is so crazy, because this is what it's equal to. What do all of the symbols in the law of universal gravitation mean? Well, FG, you probably know, means gravitational force. In the case of an object resting on the surface of a celestial body, it would be the weight of the object. The unit is the Newton, right? And again, gravitational force either means the weight of an object on or near a celestial body or the magnitude of each of a pair of mutually occurring forces between two masses. You know, the Sun attracts the Earth, the Earth attracts the Sun. Two mutually occurring forces between two masses. Uh, capital G, the universal gravitational constant, the unit we just discussed was the Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And this is a natural constant. It ties together all of the other uh, magnitudes and units right, in the law of universal gravitation. Now this, uh, as we said earlier, this constant had to be measured. And Henry Cavendish measured this constant, figured out how much it was. You know, um, other scientists, other physicists knew, uh, physicists, mathematicians, knew that there had to be a number. But uh, it was Mr. Cavendish, all right, Dr. Cavendish, if you will, that, um, that figured it all out. Now, M1 and M2. What I'm going to often do in this video is use M1 for the mass of a celestial body and then M2 for the mass of some object resting on the celestial body. But in actuality, M1 and M2 are any two objects. It could be two protons, it could be the Earth and the Sun, etc., etc., etc. The unit we've got for M1, kilogram, for M2, another kilogram. All right, and here we are, M1 would be the mass of one of a pair of mutually attracting objects, and M2 would be the mass of the second of a pair of mutually attracting objects. Now, R for radius, or distance between centers. Uh, I'm going to show you in just a minute that when you say that R represents the distance between the centers of the two objects, that actually incorporates... Um, the, the possibility that it is the radius of the larger of the two objects, of the much larger of the two objects. Let me show you that now. So how is it that R can either mean the radius of a celestial body or the distance between the centers of two objects? Well, let's take, for example, R for the Sun and the Earth. R for the Sun and the Earth would be the distance between the centers of the two objects. All right, so from here to here, that would be R. All right, now R for the Earth and the Moon would be the distance between the centers of those two objects. All right, from here to here, all right, would be R for the Earth and the Moon. But what about R for two objects like the Earth and the box? Here's the center of the box, all right? Um, here's the center of the box, and here's the center of the Earth. So it would be from here to here, 
right, r, the distance between the centers of the two objects. But in reality, all right, you've got um, the Earth, which is much, much, much larger compared to the box. So, all right, when we do this, all right, you see that the radius of the Earth, r, right, is much, much, much larger than the distance from the surface of the Earth to the box, this little extra bit here. Now, if the radius of the Earth is 6 million meters, all right, and even to three significant figures, 6,310,000 meters, let's just say the box is half a meter. So that means that the distance all right, between the centers of the two objects would be 6,310,000, all right, point five meters, right? Assuming that the box is one meter high and the distance from the surface of the earth to the middle of the box is half a meter. So you see to three significant figures that extra half a meter doesn't matter. Right? It's negligible. Right? The word negligible, negligible in physics uh, means eh, that number just doesn't matter. Right? We're not going to calculate to um, seven significant figures or eight significant figures. All right, so R actually means the distance between the centers of the two objects, but for a celestial body, a big celestial body, versus a small object resting on or near its surface, R ends up being the radius of the celestial body because the little bit that you would be adding is so small compared to the radius of the celestial body. Okay, so R, it's either the distance between the centers of the two objects or it's just the radius of a celestial body. So here's the first type of problem that the law of universal gravitation, the big G equation, can help us out with. Sample problem. Calculate the gravitational force between two protons whose centers are spaced one meter apart. So let's just draw a picture so we know what we're talking about here. All right, we've got one proton and he's got a, a positive charge. I'm not going to draw the charge so that you can, uh, I'll, I'll put it down here, positive one. All right? And here's another proton, all right, positive one. All right, so they're spaced one meter apart from their centers. All right, from there to there, that is exactly all right, one meter. So R equals one meter. All right, now you recall that all pairs of objects attract each other. This proton attracts this proton, all right? Boom, okay? We'll say um, positive Fg because it's going to the right, and, and this proton attracts this proton. Now we want this to be the same magnitude, all right? That's about right, okay? And we'll call that negative Fg because it's going to the left. All right, so what we're trying to calculate, and I'll, I'll get rid of this just for now, all right? What we're trying to calculate is the gravitational force. Now, the magnitude of this gravitational force is going to be the same as the magnitude of this gravitational force. All right, so let's, let's erase all this and start plugging in to the universal law of gravitation. Um, after we finish that part A, we'll do part B. What will the gravitational force be? If the protons' centers, the protons' apostrophe as the protons' centers are moved to 2.00 meters apart, we'll do that after we finish part A. So let's calculate the gravitational force between the two protons, and here we go. All right, capital G, big G, is the universal gravitational constant. So we've got 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, right? Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now, the mass, the masses of the two objects, one proton and another proton, so... So, the mass of one proton, 1.67, times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The mass of the other proton, again, 1.67, times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms.
times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, all right, divided by the distance between the centers of the two protons, which would be one meter, and that gets squared, all right? So let's do our math, all right, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27, times 1.67 again, times 10 to the negative 27. All right, hit equals. All right, that's the top. Now divide, 1 squared is 1, so divide that by 1. All right, and we get that Fg is equal to, to three significant figures, 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64 Newtons. How did we get Newtons? Let's see. Uh, kilograms on top twice cancels the kilograms on the bottom. Meters squared on top cancels the meters squared on the bottom. And we're left with just the Newtons. All right, so this, this is the magnitude. All right, here's my first proton, my second proton. All right, so this would be Fg here would be positive 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64, 10 to the negative 64 newtons. And this one, all right, this Fg would be negative 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64 newtons. Notice that the positive and the negative go here. All right, this, this is the magnitude up here. Those are the same. This is positive, that's negative. All right? Now, um, let's figure out what would happen if we doubled the distance between the two protons. We'll do that next. What's going to happen to the gravitational force between them if we double the distance from one meter to two meters? So we asked the question, <clears throat> What's going to happen to the gravitational force if you double the distance between the centers of the objects? In other words, if you take the two protons and change the distance between them from one meter to two meters, you just doubled the distance between them. What's going to happen to the gravitational force? Well, I'm sure you might imagine that because you're moving them further apart, that the gravitational force is going to decrease. But there's a very specific way in which the gravitational force is going to decrease. Because the law of universal gravitation happens to be an inverse square law. I'll show you one other equation that will come up when you start learning about electricity that is also an inverse square law. Here we go. The electrostatic force is equal to the electrostatic constant times the charge on a proton, for example, uh, times the charge on another particle, for example, probably another proton, divided by the distance between their centers squared. All right, so again, these two are both inverse square laws. And what do you notice right away that they have in common? On the bottom, they both have R squared. So this is Fg over 1. All right, over 1, and you notice that this is an inverse square law. In other words, Fg and R are inversely related. So when R increases, the force is going to decrease. When you move them further apart, the force between them is going to decrease. Same thing here. But it's also going to decrease in a very specific way. Now let's take a look at exactly how the force between the two protons is going to decrease if we double the distance between the two protons. Now, I want to use a trick, all right, a math trick, to figure out exactly what's going to happen to the force. This is the math trick, and I will be showing you this math trick and a lot of other relationships in the very next video, 4.6. Right, but for now, just a quick look at what happens when you double 
the distance between the two objects. All right, so if you're going to double the distance, so put a 2 over the R, and you're not going to change anything else, here's the trick. What's going to happen, now I'm going to put a 1 up here because I did not change anything up here. On the bottom, I doubled, but you have to square it because of this exponent here. All right, so what's going to happen is that the force, this force, is going to be one quarter of what it originally was. So let's take a look over here at what we expect the new force is going to be. The original force, when they were one meter apart, was 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64. The inverse square law relationship is telling us, and this little math trick here, is telling us that the new force is going to be one quarter of the original force. So you can either take 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64 and multiply by one quarter, which really means you're dividing by four. And if you do all that math, you're going to get 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65. All right. And you know that 10 to the negative 65 is less than 10 to the negative 64. All right. The other thing you could do, Again, multiply by one quarter, so multiply by 0.25. Take the 1.86 times 10 to the negative 64 newtons and multiply by 0.25. No matter how you do the math, as long as you do it correctly, you're going to find that when you double the distance between these two protons, the new force between them is going to be 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65 newtons. Now, let's try... The whole problem, all right, let's double check that this little trick here that we did is correct. Now remember, we either divided by 4, all right, or we multiplied by 0.25, okay? Multiplying by 1 over 4 is really dividing this by 4, or you multiply by 0.25, all right? So let's see if we get 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65. All right, I'm going to put that, all right, the first time we did this, Fg, we got 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65 newtons. Let's, say if, let's see if we get that when we do the whole problem, all right, but using a distance between the protons of 2 meters as opposed to 1 meter. All right, so again, Fg equals G m1, m2, over r squared. So, g, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. The mass of one proton, the mass of another proton, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And on the bottom this time, all right, r equals 2 meters and it gets squared. All right, so basically on the bottom it's going to be 4. All right, so let's do all the math and see if we get the same answer that we got using our little shortcuts there. All right, so 6.67 exponent negative 11 times 1.67 exponent negative 27 times 1.67 exponent negative 27 equals, all right, divide that by 4, and what do we get? 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65. All right, so the new force is 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65 newtons. Now, while we're at it, is this one-fourth of the original force between them? Well, let's see. All right. We've got 4.65 times 10 to the negative 65 newtons divided by the original force, 1.86, times 10 to the negative 64 newtons. Okay. And what are we finding out? Is it going to be one quarter? Is it going to be 0.25? Let's see. 4.65 uh, exponent negative 65 divided by 1.86 
exponent negative 64. And we are getting 0.25 on the nose. How about that? All right, so um, doing the entire problem uh, the long way works. Using the shortcut works. All right, and we have just demonstrated what it means to be an inverse square law. Uh, let's put that kind of into words. All right. So what exactly is an inverse square law? All right, let's take what we just did, what we just proved, right, and turn it into words. An inverse square law is a mathematical relationship between two variables. When one of the variables is multiplied by a number, the second variable is multiplied by the inverse of its square. So, if r was multiplied by 2, that means that fg is multiplied by 1 over 2 squared, or 1 over 4. All right, r is multiplied by 2. Put the 2 on the bottom, make it an inverse of 2, but you have to square it on the bottom, and you get 1 fourth. All right, so the relationship between r and fg is an inverse square relationship. There's another way that you could look at the inverse square relationship. The law of universal gravitation is an inverse square law. Uh, all this up here is what we've already discussed. The law of universal gravitation is an inverse square law. This means that the gravitational force, Fg, between two objects varies inversely with the square of the distance between them, r. Now, what you could do instead, all right, this is what we've said before, but there's a different way to look at it mathematically. To make the relationship easier to see, what if g was 1? Let's make g 1 instead of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. This is not a problem. Now, let's make all of the variables nice, simple, whole numbers. All right, so if g is 1, m1 is 2, m2 is 3, and r is 1, and we plug everything in where it belongs, all right, g is 1, m1 is 2, m2 is 3, and r is 1, don't forget to square it, what do you get? On the top, it's 2 times 3 is 6, on the bottom is 1, so you get 6. Now, double the r to 2. We've just doubled r from 1 to 2. Everything else, of course, stays the same. So now we've got fg equals 1 times 2 times 3, still 6 on top, but on the bottom we've got 2 squared, or 4. 6 divided by 4 gives you 1.5. And you notice that 1.5 is 1 fourth of 6. So when we doubled r, the force fg was multiplied by one-fourth, or reduced to one-quarter of its original value. 1.5 is one-fourth of six. Same thing, another example. Just another example showing the same thing. If g is 1, m1 is 20, and m2 is 6, and r is 2 this time. This time we're going to start with an r where they're 2 meters apart. Obviously, if we double that, they will be 4 meters apart. All right, so here we go. The first, fg. 1 times 20 times 6 is 120 divided by 4, so that's 30. Now, double the distance r from 2 to 4. Now r is 4. Everything else stayed the same. So here, 1 times 20 times 6 is 120. Take 120, divide it by 16. 4 squared is 16. You put the 4 down here for the r. So it's 120 divided by 16, and you get 7.5. And what you find, right, if you take the, if you take 30 and divide it by 4, you get 7.5. So, 7.5 is one-fourth of 30. When we doubled r, the gravitational force became one-quarter 
of what it was originally. 7.5 is one-fourth of 30. Take 30 and divide it by 4 or multiply it by 0.25. You're going to get 7.5. All right? So this is just all ways to prove that the law of universal gravitation is an inverse square law. The relationship between the distance and the gravitational force is an inverse squared relationship. So here we have another problem where we're going to calculate the mutual gravitational forces which two objects exert on each other. We calculated the mutual gravitational force between two protons. Now we're going to calculate the gravitational force which the Earth exerts on the Sun and of course the Sun exerts back on the Earth. All right, so what happens is you've got the Sun, you've got the Earth, the Earth pulls on the Sun, the Sun pulls back on the Earth. We know that these two forces are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, meaning equal in magnitude you will get the same number for this force and for this force, but one is going, one is pulling to the right, the other is pulling to the left. So this would be, let's say, positive Fg, and this one would be negative Fg. All right, now, um, the distance between them, all right, would be from the center of the sun to the center of the earth, all right, from there to there, that would be R. And of course, we're going to have to use an average distance during the course of the year because the Earth gets closer to the Sun and further from the Sun. So we're going to have to use an average distance or a mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. That's fine. Now, I'm going to take you for just a moment to the reference tables. I want you to look on the reference tables, find the mass of the Earth on the reference tables, and find the mean distance between the Sun and the Earth on the reference tables. Here we go. Alright, so you looked at the reference tables, you found that the mass of the Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Now, if you look this up on the internet, let's say you find 5.96 or 5.98, it's fine, use it, alright? Um, if you find that the mean uh, distance is 1.51 or 1.49, don't worry about it, alright? Close enough, okay? So, you can look up these uh, numbers uh, either on your reference tables, some of them, and some of them you have to go to the internet. Um, for the mass of the sun, I went to the internet. All right, so take a moment if you like, go to the internet, check out mass of sun, all right, and, and copy it down. All right, so um, here we have all of our givens. We've got the universal gravitational constant, capital G, mass of earth, all right, um, we'll call that m1, whatever, mass of sun, we'll call that m2, all right. Um, and the distance between them, all right? So now I'm going to erase all this, and we're going to do, do the math. All right, so I've plugged in capital G, the universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. The mass of the Earth, all right? The mass of the Sun. Now, if you're saying you're putting Me first and Ms second, don't switch them. All right, you're saying here you're going to put the mass of the Earth first, the mass of the Sun second. It doesn't matter, but you've got to pick one and stick to it. All right, now here's R, the distance between the two celestial bodies, 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters inside the parentheses squared goes outside the parentheses. Be careful about how you notate the math. All right, if there's no parentheses, that's wrong. All right, if you put the meters outside the parentheses, that's wrong. Okay, now... Um, as far as calculating this on the calculator, um, I've been doing this long enough. I can plug this whole thing in and hit equals once. I'm going to use parentheses on the bottom, obviously, and I will get the right answer. All right? But if you find that you're plugging into the calculator and you think you're doing everything right and you're getting the answers wrong, maybe what you should do, multiply the whole top, write it down, multi uh, uh, square the bottom, write it down, and then divide those two numbers. Let's do it that way, all right, so I can show you what I mean about being 
very, very careful with the math. If you're getting wrong numbers when you use your calculator, uh, try it this way instead. Okay, here we go. I'm going to do the top, write it down, then do the bottom, write it down, then divide. Here we go. 6.67 exponent, negative 11, times 5.97 exponent, 24, times 1.989 exponent, 30. All right, equals. So on top, we've got 7.920 times 10 to the 44. All right, we'll worry about the units at the end, all right, or the correct unit at the end. All right, now, 7.92 times 10 to the 44. Okay, 1.5 exponent 11. We need to square that, squared. Okay, 2.25 times 10 to the 20 second. All right, so now I'm going to divide these two numbers. All right, I, I multiplied all these, wrote it on top, squared this, wrote it on the bottom. All right, here we go. All right, I'm being very careful to make sure I'm not plugging the whole thing in and clicking the, the equal sign once because sometimes that's a good way to make mistakes. All right, here we go. 7.92, you don't need the zero, exponent 44 divided by... 2.25 exponent 22 equals, all right, 3.52 times 10 to the 22nd, and the unit for force would be newtons. All right, so this is the magnitude of the gravitational force that the Earth exerts on the sun, and the sun exerts back on the earth. And I tell you what, I'm going to plug all of this in just once, and let's see if we get the same answer. 3.52 times 10 to the 22nd. All right, here we go. 6.67 exponent negative 11 times 5.97 exponent 24 times 1.989 exponent 30. All right, I'm, I hit equals. Now I'm going to hit divided by. I'm going to open parentheses. 1.5 exponent, right, 11, square that, close the parentheses, and I hope, I pray, I get 3.52 times 10 to the 22nd. We did it! <laughs>